Welcome everyone. This is going to be a little behind the scenes of our new short film we've released as a promotion called The Black Bass of Lake Murray. And who would have guessed it? It's about Lake Murray in Papua New Guinea, one of our most favourite destinations, which has all of a sudden proved very popular now with the release of the film. So we've got an expert here with me. He's Glenn Watt. He's one of the Angling Adventures <laughs> teams. He has been to Papua New Guinea how many times? Been there twice now, Uncle D-Man. So you visited Lake Lake Murray. You visited Lake Murray to film this little promo vid and then you've done a subsequent trip as doing a big maintenance run with all the boys fixing up boats and all the rest of it. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Both both super valuable trips. Um, you know, we, we, we fished purely as clients on the first trip in September in 2022. And then I've been back since in, uh, in February of 2023 to make sure that we're up and going and ready to go for the 2023 season as far as our maintenance and, and boat operations go. So, yeah, look, really looking forward to kicking the season off. Awesome. So the idea of this is we're going to watch this little promo film that you've uh, videoed with our little brother, Nick, on your first trip. And as we go through, I'm about to go to Lake Murray in exactly one month from today. So I'm going to ask you all the stupid questions that everyone wants to know about all the little intricate details and really pick your brains about each aspect of uh, what a trip to Lake Murray involves. So are you ready to get <laughs> yeah. all the annoying questions? I'm ready for that. Uh, my guy, my, um, my day job as a fishing guide entails 100% of answering the same questions all the time. So I'm ready for it. And I know that you being quite European these days, living in Scotland, ye olde Scotland, um, aren't as in touch with the, uh, the tropical fishing of the Southern hemisphere as you perhaps once were. So Let's have at it. No worries. I'm happy to admit I'm an absolute Gumby. And instead of hassling you every couple of days with uh, WhatsApp messages asking what line I need and what hooks I need, how about we just do it here? So let's get it going. (laughs) Yeah, we'll get it going. I definitely wouldn't call you a Gumby considering you were a fishing guide for a couple of years in some of the best big barra destinations in Australia. But you haven't been to Papua New Guinea yet, which is a whole nother kettle of fish. So let's dive into that. We have a lower lake, middle lake, and an upper lake. We find in a lake. Right. He's just uh, running through the absolute massive scale of uh, Lake Murray. I've got a little note here saying that the biggest lake in Australia, Lake Mulwala, is 439 kilometres squared. That's pretty big. Lake Murray is 647 kilometres squared. Just what's it like when you fly in? What are you up against? <laughs> what do you see before you? <laughs> yeah, it, it, true, it, it really is an amazing system. I, I, I know I've said it on every single interview that I've done about this, but um, I've fished Lake Mulwala and it's a big system, but it's a, it's a puddle compared to Lake Murray and an entirely different setup in that um, Lake Murray is entirely natural. It essentially is 460,000 acres of... It's essentially a massive lake fed by five rivers um, the size of the Murray River or the Darling, or the Daly, or the South, or the East, or the Vic, or any other massive river that you could imagine. It's crazy. Uh, into a massive floodplain river, and then runs out through the the Strickland, and eventually into the Fly River, and out into the Gulf of Papua, uh, 150 k's downstream. The The expanse of the lake itself sustains five villages um, for the last however many thousand of years, well before whitefellas were ever a consideration out there. And you just can't comprehend the amount of fishable water and 
fish there is to catch in in a system of that size. I, I I know there's other big systems in the world, but this is massive as far as accessible fishable water for particularly Australian clients. Uh, it is a huge area. Yeah, so may as well just cover it. Where does all the water come from? I mean, what is the weather like over there? It must just be raining quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Robert Bates, who, who owns Trans New Guinea Tours and, and Lake Mary Lodge, says that it rains all the time in New Guinea, just sometimes more than others. And and he and he's dead right. And it, it like it, it it's reflective of the the wet season, dry season stuff we have up here in Darwin where I live. Um, but perhaps extended and accentuated to a larger degree. It starts earlier, finishes later and there's more of it, right? So uh you know, even in July in Lake Murray or, or anywhere through Papua New Guinea or, or that Western province, Southern Islands, you're going to get rain at least once a week. It, it, it's a wet tropical yeah, place yeah. and totally inaccessible from everything else. And um, I mean, the nature and the fishing and the, and the whole landscape in, entirely revolves around around the rain and so it, it rains most from say end of end of october say into november through until the uh, end of march and then it starts to tailor off i mean i've been in touch with the lodge at lake murray really recently and uh, and lake murray is um the water level is falling as of say early april um but you know you still get rain throughout the year so one thing you yeah. need to bring when you come to fish lake murray is a raincoat for sure yeah obviously <laughs> um what time of year was this film you can see uh the blokes with the dugout canoes here the water's right up to the grass line yeah so uh we were there in that was middle of september 2022 to yeah. uh when we film film this um promotional film and that's when the water is i guess on the way up on a when it's when it's looking like it's going to be a wet year you know you get the yeah, early okay. build up storms and high in the catchment and and it starts to bring the lake up the fishing was still really good when i was there in february uh when the lake was perhaps two meters higher than when it was when I was there in September, uh, the bass fishing was quite difficult. In fact, we only caught one bass uh, over a couple of sessions. Um, plenty of barra to be caught. Um, <laughs> it's it's funny when you have a destination where an eighty centimeter barra is an, is sort of a, an annoying or a or a really sideshow bycatch. Um, but plenty of barrier to be caught when the water's high, but the bass really, really happens during that season from end of March through till the end of November or, um, you know, thereabouts. Yeah. So that's when the, uh, the trips kick off from the lodge. So, all right, we better get cracking. We're only, uh, 19 seconds into this. So. <laughs> have a black bass, a uh, world's freshwater strongest fish in catching them. They, uh, they fight back. We have seen uh, black bass uh, breaking uh, their fishing rods, rod tips. And, uh... All right, so one of the guys there is just going on about a few of the different species that can be caught. Um, I'll just see if we can get up on screen something that Australian fishermen aren't going to be familiar with at all. The snakehead. Now, these things... Apparently, they're an invasive species there, but is it right that you see them like topping like uh, tarpon or something as you're driving around the lake? Yeah, that's right. So, snakehead are an introduced species uh, in the southern highlands of New Guinea, and they have become a major food source for the big barra and, and black bass. Uh, they 
tend not to be something that we target um, predominantly when we're doing our lure fishing, although an amazing fly casting and, and light tackle surface um, target species. But yeah, we, we definitely see a lot of them uh, in, in the grassy edges, um, feeding on whatever it might be, you know, um, same as what we have up here in the territory, you get a lot of a lot of lizards running around on the surface and, and frogs, of course, and then, of course, plenty of big insects. And, and those particular snakehead, they're, they're working hard throughout the day, uh, very visual predator um, along the edges and in amongst the lilies getting a feed. And um, particularly once we get to Ben's back and, and also Lake Murray um, to a lesser extent, they, they're at, they themselves are actually a, a forage species as well, which for a 50 centimetre fish sort of seems a bit unrealistic, but that's the way it is over in New Guinea. Yeah, right. And there should be Saratoga amongst them as well. And what else do you find? Is it catfish and all the other usual suspects, barramundi, obviously? Yeah, that's right. I mean, definitely uh, plenty of Saratoga. Uh, at, uh, you'll find Saratoga right throughout the whole of, um, of New Guinea. Um, Plenty of big ones. They actually sell Saratoga at the market over there for people to eat and, and they're considered a, a good solid feed from the locals, um, a, as well as your, your catfish, um, their snake neck tortoise and, and a lot of other um, species that are familiar with a, with a northern environment. The one that we don't have, uh, say, here in Darwin compared to New Guinea is the tilapia. Uh, I know they're... Um, causing a bit of trouble over there in Queensland these days. But yeah, tilapia is another one. And and again, an introduced species um, by the government so that the local blokes have got something that they can go and um, get a quick feed of, which they do. Um, and we can we can use that knowledge and, and mimic the, the, the fish um, to try and get those big predatory species to eat a lure as well, a lure or a fly, um, you know, in, in the presence of a tilapia or a snakehead or a saratoga. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, when I'm there in a month, I'm that's top of my list to catch one of the, uh, the snakehead. <laughs> it's a long way to go to catch a snakehead, but I think it'd be pretty cool. Oh, for sure. And, and I mean, they eat, they, they eat the, the simplest lure in the entire world to throw is a spinner bait. Throw it out there in the weeds like we do here for the Saratoga in the Territory. Throw it out there and wind it back. And a snakehead of Saratoga will eat it as well. A bass will eat it as well. Um, you, you almost certainly will not ever catch a barramundi on a spinner bait, but the rest of the, the big three over there will definitely eat them. So a great way to go for sure. Yeah, right. Well, just a, another quick question on tackle, since it's a good uh, example right here with little Nicholas, the little brother has forgotten to change his hooks on his lures. You can see the front one there has been upgraded to a nice owner by the looks of it. And the back two trebles, which are probably, I wouldn't even change them for Barramundi in Australia. They just look like the standard scorpion trebles to me, but didn't last against the bass. Yeah, that's right. Actually, when you if you look closely, there's actually three different hooks on that lure, and and that that's a that's a one twenty five scorpion um, RMG scorpion, which is one of the toughest lures you know um, in the world. Um, I mean, if it stands up to, uh, I mean, you and you and me have both fished them for fifty pound mackerel in in, uh, in the Kimberley and um, had other lures bitten in half when these things stand up. But the front hook on that one is actually a BKK Raptor hook, yeah. um, which is super tough. It's a 6X hook. The middle one is the standard hook. Even <laughs> though it's a, it's, a, it's a 3X mustard or something similar, but, it, but a, a, a strong hook and, and you'd fish it up here for Barra um, every day of the week straight out of the box. And I think the back hook had been upgraded as well. And it's a, a, it's a bit hard for me to recall, but that might be an owner ST66. And that's the other real hot or, or the must have hook when you're upgrading tackle um, for the bass. But yeah, I mean, we were there. That was our first trip. And um, I mean, those hooks, those good hooks, they, they cost a bit of money. So 
we weren't upgrading every single one and <laughs> there you go there's the result <laughs> yeah well that's it i mean you you go a long way to get a bent hook um worth spending the extra couple of bucks to to stick on a, a 6x even if it's a bit painful when you lose it in the snag but hey there you go oh for sure and even if you if you only want to buy a couple of packets of them, um, I mean, we've got some good associations with some amazing hook guys these days uh, and just change them out on your lures as you, as you swap your lures. You're not going to change lures too much. Um, and those hooks, they're less than a dollar each, but they still it still hurts when you buy them and, and it hurts <laughs> even more when you lose them. But it hurts even more when you regret not upgrading yeah. them uh, because you just had a 40-pounder swim off halfway back to the boat for sure so yeah, yeah. you know one or two dollars at the at the end of a um at the end of the trip you know it, it should be part of uh, of your budgeting that's right i mean how much would you pay not to lose that fish 100 bucks 200 bucks yeah, exactly. you know on and on you go and a, there's an extra, plenty of hooks there an extra dollar <laughs> yeah an extra dollar that's right yeah and we smashing them up they're angry Twelve months ago, we came across this business that was for sale called Angling Adventures through my brother's contacts. We ended up buying this business, and and the first port of call was to come to Papua New Guinea to. Uh... Right, uh, there's little Nick just describing the the trip in. Do you want to just give us a quick rundown of uh, flights and what it takes to get to to Lake Murray? Yeah. Oh, by the way, I love that we're calling him Little Nick. Um, the youngest brother of the three, of the three. I'll call you Big uh, Wadi then. <clears throat> yeah, big big fella, like my kids call me, just like off Louie. Um, yeah, I mean the 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 whole setup. Uh, once you pull the trigger on a trip, it is is super easy from a client's point of view. Um, Angling Adventures, which is us, takes care of of all the flights. As uh, once you get yourself from either Brisbane or Cairns. And uh, uh, these days, and now that flights are coming back, um, a, a little bit more and more um, better schedules each time, each month, it, uh, we can get you out of Cairns and, and into, into Lake Murray on the same day or if not the day before and then on the way out from Lake Murray and back to Cairns, particularly the same day, which is what we did in February, which was really great. Uh, one thing I'll touch on as well about um, – Mount Hagen there and, and, and traveling in Papua New Guinea in general is that it, it, it can be seen particularly or um, almost solely by Australian travelers because the rest of the world's quite happy to travel to New Guinea um, is that uh, Aussie travelers have found it quite intimidating or sometimes been fearful to travel to Papua New Guinea. Um, Papua, uh, Mount Hagen, which is where that, that particular video footage was taken is uh, while it's it's not the same as Australia, the the vibe and the people and the generosity um, certainly is. Um, you know, we we stopped and played a couple of games of darts um, with the guys in Mount Hagen there for a bottle Just of on coke the side of the road. Um, on the side of the road at the Beetle Nut Market. Um, and, you know, Mount Hagen, it's a small town. It might be the size of Ballarat. There's a couple of hundred thousand people, same as Darwin. Um, so the security guy who works for Trans New Guinea Tours knows the guys who are running these markets, you know. So um, it, if you if you want to stop in, you stop in and, and they'll give you a run around and, and just sort of immerse yourself gently into it for a start on your, on your very first day. And, and um and really embrace just that the similarities but the differences between the two cultures you know remembering that Papua New Guinea was actually part of Australia up until about 50 years ago um a lot of the a lot of our values values and and stuff are, are very similar and um and and that it, it was just such a really cool cool fun way for us to start our trip something yeah, that we yeah. really wanted to do but but not necessarily something that everyone wants to do you can jump straight in the bus from the airport uh which is a private bus from transient tours and 
pop straight up to uh, Rondon Ridge Lodge, which is a five-star lodge, flasher than anything that I'd ever stayed in at the time. So um, you can <laughs> you can go both ways or a little bit in between and, and have whatever experience you, you really came for. Yeah, yeah. So the bones of it is fly from either Brisbane or Cairns, go to Port Moresby, Port Moresby then fly to Mount Hagen, get picked up by your chauffeur, taken up to Rondon Ridge Lodge, the very fancy lodge, and then pretty much the following day fly out to Lake Murray and land on the island. Or it's looking like maybe coming up in future, there could just be flights straight to Mount Hagen. Did I, did I hear that correctly? Yeah, that's right. So um, there, there's an international airport at Mount Hagen and it was running prior to uh, COVID shutting everything down. So the, uh, the, the opportunity in the very near future is to fly straight from Cairns to Mount Hagen, clear customs there. And then, and then, the, and then depending on flight schedules, potentially be at the lodge that afternoon before lunch and, and fishing for an afternoon session. Either that or staying uh, an evening, uh, one night at Ron Ridge Lodge, which, it, which I actually highly recommend because there's seven species of birds of paradise, uh, you know, the yeah. rarest birds in the entire world. The, the lodge itself, even though it's in a tropical environment where in Port Moresby you're sweating um, like you do here in Darwin in the wet season, uh, once you get to Rondon Ridge Lodge, you, you're at the same altitude as Mount Kosciuszko. <laughs> Up the stairs, it's cold, it's beautiful. I mean, the whole experience is just something that uh, that should be done. But um, but you can potentially in the future dodge staying that night, that first overnight at Rondon Ridge Lodge um, once the international airport opens at Mount Hagen and be fishing from Cairns in the morning for a seven o'clock departure from Cairns, be fishing for after lunch at, um, at Lake Murray, be, you know, because it's so close. Eh? Something that a lot of people forget about is see how close it is. Yeah, yeah, unreal, in a totally different world. And uh, I'll, just, I'll just flag, there is no rod tubes looking like they're getting put on the plane. So we'll just keep that in mind for later, shall we? Meet the lodge owner. No, don't even yeah, we can talk about that later. <laughs> so, who's this fellow flying the plane? Who is the pilot? <laughs> this, uh, who is the pilot? That, that's Robert Bates or Bob, uh, who you instantly connect with as your, your third grandpa. Um, an amazing man uh, one of the truly most inspirational people that I've ever met he's got six lodges throughout um, Papua New Guinea including another mothership operation up in the north of the country uh, he's been there for over 50 years um, he allowed it so I'm sure that they would elect him Prime Minister but he's he's happy just doing his own thing uh, and taking people like you and uh, you and me fishing and, and flying his aeroplane like his old caravan there, which, I mean, you get sitting around the, the dinner table with Bob and, and asking him stories about his life. That's a, that's a whole nother experience on its own. So, yeah, that's um, <laughs> young fella Bob is the pilot. Young fella Bob who built the lodge. Oh, me Bob, young fella Bob. <laughs> Very excited. You're ner not nervous. Yeah, well, you said I have to land it, didn't you? Oh, yeah. 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 It's only yes. my first time. Yeah. You got it, buddy. The clouds parted, and you just see this massive floodplain system lake, and, and um, yeah, your fingertips start shaking, just getting ready for those fish. And very quickly after that, we land at the local airstrip, load the gear into the boat, and, and zip around here to the lodge, and, and it's just a paradise. This is Lake Murray Lodge, Western Province, PNG. Only three flights, two days, here we are. So there you are, landed on the island. Looks like there's a fair few buildings and stuff around, but you can't get there by road. So how on earth do you build a big fishing lodge full of cabins and everything in the middle of nowhere with no roads? 
Oh, another extraordinary story um, <laughs> attributed to attributed to Bob. I mean, uh, I mean, Nick uh, talks about the the effort to get there uh, in that clip, uh, and certainly at the moment from Cairns, it's six flights um, there and back uh, by the time you finish your trip. Um, you know, a, a, as Mount Hagen opens up, it, it'll probably be knocked back to four. And we're looking at 2025 to um, change the schedule entirely and fly charter, um, you know, charter planes out of Darwin or Cairns um, to be one direct flight straight to the lodge. So <laughs> it's something to keep in mind for future. But super uh, exciting for all of us. I think one of the one of the special bits is going to be that last flight. What is it, an hour or something from Rondon Ridge, with. Bob, Bob possibly flying the plane and landing on the lake on an island. Oh yeah, I mean that. It's something I've done it a couple of times now, and in fact, earlier in this year we we did a bit of a bit of a lap around, and we went to Ben's back before we went to Lake Murray. So I got to see a few other remote airstrips as well. But uh, to fly a small plane, a, a, ca- a caravan aeroplane, which a, a lot of FIFO guys um, and remote airstrip guys would be familiar with, they carry a lot of weight and, and a lot of people um, for a small plane. And you've got to fly that sucker straight up out out of this valley um, over over a massive mountain range, and then and then down through more mountains, and then you sort of you're still high, but you you sort of part the clouds and and you're out onto the floodplains. Um, the experience to do it with the guy that built the lodge and owns the aeroplane, it brings a tear to my eye how <laughs> how much that means actually because Bob's such a good bloke and and um, I feel really lucky to have been able to do that with him and and I'm sure for for a few more years at least. Um, a lot of clients will be able to do that as well. Yeah, so just give us a potted uh, story of how he got the lodge up there. Oh, so we, to to build the Lake Murray Lodge, I mean, it, it's only been going since 2012 or 14, I believe. Uh, yeah, I mean, the original owner of Angling Adventures, Gary Barnby, um, flying to another destination. He was actually going trout fishing was the original story that I heard. Um, and, I, and I've got, don't worry, I've got my eye on, on those locations as well. Um, but flew over Lake Murray and, um, and the pilot, which I, who I assume was Bob, said, oh, there's plenty of bat, um, barra down there and, and, um, and the Papua New Guinea black bass as well. And 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 a couple of years later they did a recon trip and then a couple of years after that they they started building the the lodge and and they built the lodge by bringing a um a barge up the fly river hundreds of kilometers up into lake uh, Murray. isn't it 700 k's long or something i think the fly river it's into the strickland it's huge <laughs> yeah the fly the strickland and into lake Murray. And then uh, landed on this piece of land, which uh, was was government land, and and also ordered to build a lodge on there, um, with half a dozen shipping containers filled with every single thing to build a, the lodge that that you and and I stay in, um, from the the you know like the tap washers down to the tiles in the shower. <laughs> uh, and the, and the and the fans and the light switches in in one trip entirely extraordinary uh story and scenario and i i challenge anyone in australia particularly to have accomplished such a feat um bob's done it half a dozen times in new guinea um <laughs> simply because he because he's a brilliant man and because he can uh, um so they built the lodge and then uh, um so from from the initial trip, um, two years after, uh, there was the first groups going in there, and, and that was about that was about nine years ago now, and uh, and they had some really good times up until COVID, and then you know of course we're just kicking it back off again now. So there's some big things ahead for Lake Murray Lodge. It's um, the lodge itself is spectacular. It's won um, architectural awards. 
it, it's it's right in amongst some of the most um, uninhabited wilderness in the world, and um, and I would love to spend ten months of the year there if I could, which I might at some stage. <laughs> I'm just going to flick through a couple of the pictures. There's you guys sitting on the <clears throat> the veranda of, I think it's the main building, right on the edge. Yeah, of the that's water. right. That's the main Drink. building there, and all the all the timber source, local sources, and and, and everything. It, if you have a close look at the the ceiling there in the lodge, there it's all um, sort of weave thatched um, pandanus leaf, and it it's all done done by a local guy. And and Bob and and the guys at the lodge will tell you when you look. When you walk into the main complex, the whole pe- the whole ceiling of the floor, which is it's ten meters by twenty meters at least wide, was done in one piece, lifted up, and that's that becomes wow. a ceiling. So <laughs> just some amazing, amazing efforts goes in into building this lodge, and and it's all and it's all it's all just to get people fishing and sharing culture, um, and and of course the birding and and wildlife and stuff that's associated with the Tondo um, National Park down there in the Western Province as well. But yeah, it's a spectacular place. So this is the lodge as well, yeah? Just a quick look at the inside of it. <clears throat> Polished floor. That's the lodge looking, looking out towards the lake, that's right, yeah. And you've got the bar there on the left where Jerome will be sitting and, and waiting for you to go and grab another SP lager. But um, <laughs> yeah, that that's it. And you pretty much... The the thing that uh, a lot of people won't understand or or um, even think about, I guess, for a start, is that that whole lodge. It, uh, when you book a a group of six to go fishing at Lake Murray, the whole lodge is yours. There's no one else there. There might be a couple of other workers from the rubber tree factory, um, you know, around the corner. But but it's but that's it. And you get one of those rooms there that you can see with the big king size bed and the ensuite in the balcony each person gets one of those so it's super <laughs> luxury a... and so nice so you're not staying in a in a donger like corroboree park tavern or you're not crammed into a little mothership bunk that that's a room for one person yeah yeah that's the room for one person and every single one of those rooms looks out over the lake and and uh yeah i mean the serenity that's attached to that i mean Dale uh, Kerrigan would, would have a conniption thinking about that. <laughs> you can see just like uh, all the lily pads and, and the weed mats and stuff right out the front. Oh. You can cast a frog off your balcony and catch a Saratoga or a snakehead almost any morning before you went fishing for sure. And it's all fly screened off and everything. Keep the all mozzie free and you got to... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we... Yeah, it's one thing that was a big surprise to me. I mean, I went over there quite wary of uh, things like malaria and, and other mozzie stuff. Um, being here from being from Darwin and, and sort of living in amongst the tropics and, and that situation all the time, I I actually, I, honestly, we, I've got more mozzies at my house here in Darwin than, than we had at Lake Murray and, and, all, and also Ben's back. Um, yeah. but, but definitely at Lake Murray... Um, the the mozzie worry is it's really minimal. I mean, you're going to get the same amount of mozzies fishing the Barma Forest or fishing the Glenelg River, fishing the daily as you as you are fishing the Lake Murray. So you know, a squirt of bushman's here and there in the morning, um, and and wearing your long 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 pants, long sleeves, which you're going to do when you're fishing anyway. It's all you have to do. Uh, some people take the um, preventative malaria medication. I I don't, and um, a lot of people don't, and there's been no problems. So it's it's up to people to make that decision. But yeah, there's definitely no, it's not crazy as far as that sort of thing goes. Alrighty, we've landed in Lake Murray. So we've got four guides here at Lake Murray. We've got Smitty. He's uh, the master of calling out what's on the sounder. 11 feet, they're hungry fish. We've got Dennis, he's the master hunter. We've got Mare, he's the number one uh, cassowary trapper. And we've got Jam Well, last time I was here with Jam Well, he cut up a barramundi, filleted it, and cooked it on the fire, all using his huge machete, his bush knife. So he's the cook. <laughs> 
<laughs> so Nicholas has just rattled off the uh, the guides there. One's a cassowary trapper, one's a hunter, one's a cook. Give us a rundown on the guides and who they are and uh, their their story. Yeah, they're they're all amazing fellas, and um, they're they're all standouts in their own communities. There's five villages that um, surround Lake Murray Lodge. And these guys all come from various different villages um, and, and represent different areas around the lodge, uh, which is part of the agreement we have when we go fishing. And um, Smithy's probably the, he, he's the elder statesman of the, of the group. And his, his number one hobby is, um, is, is making friends with, with people uh, with international tourists, with, with fishermen. And he re he just relishes the connection and uh, and and really considers anyone who he um, takes fishing with as brother or sister. It, it's so wholesome and, and and amazing feeling that you get when you go fishing with Smith, um, as well as I I would I, I mean I tried to describe him uh, to other people, but um, he, he's the Rex Hunt of um, of 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 footy commentary of, of the sounder, um, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the thing about um, bass fishing, uh, particularly for trolling and uh, different if you're casting and stuff, of course, but uh, quite often we'll troll over an area and, and then go back and cast at it. But uh, you can see them. They, they stick out like dog nuts on them because they're big and they're round and, and you can see them that, and, yeah. and they're generally sitting down a bit deeper. Barramundi are a bit longer and slender and, and they sit up a bit higher. So really easy to distinguish the two on the sounder. And, and the Rex Hunt footy commentary of, of, of the sounder, you know, like he, he's looking out the window, boys, pull a roof off his head. And, <laughs> and you start jigging your lures and, and sure enough, you'll get a bass and stuff like that. It's just it, great bloke. Um, uh, and really values everyone's company it, it, is Smith. Um, who do we have next? Dennis? Dennis uh, is in there. Yeah. Dennis is the fellow Dennis, with uh, the, the safety glasses yeah. and the sticker on them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. So Dennis, Dennis and Smith are the two are the two fishing guides uh, and Mayor and Jamwell are the two boat operators, although they all share the roles evenly. Um, that That is their identified role within the group. Um, so Dennis, so, so when you're on a Dennis boat, you've a, got when you're on a boat, you've got a, a bloke driving the boat and one bloke uh, netting the fish. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So you'll either have uh, Jamwell or Mayor uh, driving the boat, or and um, and then you've got Dennis and and Smithy. Um, you know, tying your knots, a tie a mad FG knot, tie a great uh, loop knot. You you don't worry about tying your own knots. The boys can do it. They select all your lures, um, net fish better than anyone I've ever seen, and um, and and they truly are great fishing guides. Uh, but to get back to the individuals, um, Dennis is well known am amongst his village as being a really good hunter, and and um, <laughs> yeah, and I I mean I I actually I said to this to a fella on the phone today. Um, you know, this is the difference in the in the culture and, and just how our lives are. I said to Dennis, have you ever been to Mount Hagen, mate? And he, you know, which is an hour and a half flight away. It's a fair way and through mountains and swamps and rivers and all sorts. And he said, yeah, yeah, I went there for my um, my cousin's wedding a couple of years ago. And I was like, oh, beauty, did you get the, did you catch a plane there, mate, and that, um, from the lodge? And he said, no, no, I walked. <laughs> <laughs> So where Dennis's village is, he's got to Deeper. cross full of rivers um, before he even gets on some dry country, and then um, and then walk for four weeks for a month to get to the wedding. Um, wow! With a with a bush knife, and they and they call it uh, with a gas lighter, um, with a big lighter, and pretty well that's all he <laughs> took. And um, and stopping in at villages and various people he knew on the way and. Went to the wedding for ten days, great party, and then just walked home. And <laughs> and and to me, I just like, wow, you 
he just made me feel so minuscule as a man. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm sitting here worried about my um, my pillow being fluffy enough at night or my air con not being set on the right degrees and, and Dennis is walking to his cousin's wedding for a month um, with a bush knife and a Bic lighter. Uh, <laughs> but for yeah, me, that's I mean, where it's really at, right? <laughs> that's awesome. Um, yeah, so, and then, okay, uh, so that's the two, I guess, fishing guides. And then, uh, so GM Well, um, great boat, boat operator. Oh, um, and... Damn well, one of his great stories that he told us in, in September in 2022 was that it was his father, um, who still, it was his birthday when we were there in September, which is right around Independence Day, which is a, is a really proud celebration for these guys. Uh, and um, Damn well's father was in, he, he was in the first group of um, guys in, in their whole village, their whole province to ever see a white fella. And it was during World War Two when the Aussie guys, they'd um, sort of rocked up from Darwin as the Japanese soldiers pushed set south through New Guinea. Uh, and the Aussie guys said, you know, hey, boys, um, there's some bad guys coming. Well, let's team up type thing. And, and you know, the rest is history. Um, wow. But, yeah, Jam Wells' father, who's still alive now, um was was the first people in in their vill- in their whole province to to meet white fellows to meet Aussies and and here I go well and up again like <laughs> it just it goes to show the the history and the connection that we all have and it's it truly is awesome. It's um, amazing as that far it's as so, Wells, so close and yet it could be just another universe. Oh, one hundred percent. You know, like the. These guys, uh, um, they have a uniform that they wear to work, but day to day they live off the land. What what they eat comes from the forest and the lake, and, and their and their and their gardens, which they grow, which is um, you know bananas and yams and other other um, root vegetables, which they grow along there. They they virtually have um, there's no influence from the outside world. Uh, apart from having a mobile phone to be able to know when you've got to go to work, uh, but they don't have power at their houses. Um, it, it's a really wholesome, clean, and just honest life. And and I mean, I I just I just hope and and I'm sure that it will stay that way for a long time. Um, okay, moving on from Jam. Well, we got Mayor, who's he's like the owner of the guide group. Um, we call him we we call him Fifty Cent. He, he's got the big guns and he, and he's a handsome man and and he <laughs> is he's well known in his in his particular village as uh, as the number one cassowary trapper and uh, it's it's an interesting concept. From, like here in Darwin, we don't have cassowaries, of course, in Cairns and tropical Queensland, you do and and they're protected and they're this and that. Um, but but. In uh, in the western province of New Guinea, they are the best um, uh, table fare for these local guys because <laughs> because they don't have a, a fridge and and power. Uh, it's the meat that lasts the longest when you hang it out of a tree. Like they've got pigs, yeah. they've got deer, they've got cattle, they've got fish, they've got turtles, they've got all sorts. But the cassowary is the go because you can hang it for a, from a tree for. A, two weeks and it doesn't go bad. So, so <laughs> nothing. And, and, it. <laughs> and they're a different type of, they're a different, they're, they're a different type of cassowary. They're, they're quite small. So they might only come up to your waist. Um, whereas the cassowaries again, Northern Queensland come up to your shoulders and, and quite yeah. dangerous birds. But yeah, the, the, the trapping and the hunting are two different things too. Um, you know, Dennis being a great hunter is, is bow and arrow and spear and yeah. mare being a, great trapper is um is with snares and traps so yeah, um, cool. <laughs> like super interesting stuff to dig into when you're fishing with them but also you know a big part of going to lake murray if you're not an angler it is the um tours as well and and these are all the things that you dive right into when you go and spend a few days in the villages with these guys and and their families and 
I mean, I just they, they spend three months building a dugout canoe, um, and and then just roll it into the lake, and and that's their daily driver, and it I just, <laughs> it, it blows me away, and I and yeah. I just want to spend that's... more time there, just learning about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's everything you you wanted to do from uh, from Bush Tucker Man or or Malcolm Douglas. I mean, being able to just yarn oh. to these blokes who who probably born on the lake, and you can just yarn to them while you're trolling down the river. Definitely, definitely born on the lake. You know, we go we go back to the lodge of an evening after they drop us off to a um, to a four course meal uh, prepared by a. a a chef uh, of great renown and, and these guys paddle their canoes back, back to their villages with, with no power and, and cook up a feed themselves at home. So um, absolute soul to the earth and um, cannot speak more highly of the, of the guides and the staff at the lodge. So yeah, awesome. So just, um, just being while, a gentle and, and legendary people. Just while we're on that, uh, a couple of bits left out about the lodge. So you've got, someone doing all your cooking you've got cold beer it seems like you got internet out there you probably don't have a uh, flat screen telly to watch the footy on what and you get your laundry done every day something like that yeah yeah you're pretty well spot on there so you definitely have um you, when you land in new guinea telstra if you run with telstra will send you a message saying that you've been um, hooked up to their network and you can uh, you can do a certain amount of gigs per day or whatever it is for 10 bucks and stuff. So you've definitely got uh, full comms, um, both at Lake Marianne and Ben's back. Um, yeah, there's, def- there's definitely no television there. But, um, yeah, as far as laundry and stuff goes, I mean, as far as a fishing trip goes, you're fishing for five and a half days, take two, maybe three sets of fishing clothes um, and – and either stomp on them in the shower, which you've got in your en suite bedroom looking out <laughs> over the lake, um, and hang them up to dry under the fan at night. Or, um, yeah, there's a laundry service each day as well. So, uh, I mean, you can take you could you could take two sets and, and rotate through for the week if you really want to travel light and yeah. um, fill More that 30 kilos gear. of luggage up for fish and lures and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so what is it, 20 or th- uh, twenty kilos, isn't it? You can take on the light plane of just fishing gear and clothes and everything and you can't take a big box of frozen fish home with you, obviously, on the way out. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, you don't take any- we definitely don't take anything out. Um, you, you can take the, the available weight in um, per person and, and re- remembering that you are going on you, um, when you fly from Cairns at the moment, you're going international then domestic then charter flight um so you want to be pretty mobile with your luggage and and keep it pretty small and and look you definitely don't need anything to keep you warm it it's you know it's where i am it's darwin but it's like that every day of the year um we they just don't get cold weather there so you can cut back on the clothes and increase on the fishing gear an amazing system uh, looking at it on the chart you don't realize how big it is um, there are four or five rivers uh, floodplain rivers pouring into a big essentially flooded lake and then only one main river out so the... so we might as well <clears throat> have a bit of a run through you can see you guys trolling around out on these massive expanses of the lake with the drone flying around you just give us a rundown on sort of what kind of fishing on your trip and maybe what's possible yeah so we um on our trip in september we we really just um we were really keen to just do what they'd been doing in the last few years uh which had evolved um in the nine year or eight say eight years since the lodge had started um to pretty much being um mainly focused on trolling and um it's it's a super productive way to catch the bass there at Lake Murray. I mean if you if you troll all day you're gonna catch probably probably but in a boat between three people, you're probably gonna catch thirty or forty bass. Um or, or thirty or forty fish. Ten ten of them are gonna be barra, 
20 of them are going to be um, going to be bass. But uh, I was really keen to um, sort of suss it out from the um, angle of of lure casting um, and, and fly casting, and, and get it back to, I guess, the, what what was essentially the roots of the trip when you know. Um, Pip Clement, one of Australia's greatest sport fishermen and, and, and particularly remote destination pioneers, um, when when Pip went there to really pioneer the the lake, he was the first guy, uh, first white fella to go in there to sport fish it. Uh, caught fish on fly, caught fish on surface, caught most of his fish casting, and and, and the prospecting that he did for for um, I guess fishing hotspots and, and locations for the guides to fish was done with um with uh trolled hard body lures with the hooks taken off them hmm. so we're really uh it, it did evolve uh with the certain clientele um over those following years to to be focused more on trolling um which which has been its legacy but i mean it's 160 000 acres five rivers flowing into it, one river flowing out of it. The, the amount of country there is to cast lures, uh, you know, when I say cast lures, I, I mean, uh, I'm talking about water that's three metres or less. I um, mean, you can you can jig um, sinking vibes and stuff on the five metre snags that we've got uh, at the moment and catch as many bass as you want. That's fine. Um, but when I talk about casting lures, I'm talking three or four metres um, and, and particularly fly um, some sunken timber or lily pads that have got fish within that top two metres of the surface. And and there is ample opportunity for that. We did plenty of it. Um, mostly the stuff you'll see later on the video is me get towed up into snags because I, uh, number one, wasn't ready for it. <laughs> and number two, we perhaps weren't doing, or, or the guide boats weren't set up um, well enough for it. We, why don't we? We'll talk about that later on. But as far as the fishing goes, uh, it, initially the destination was flagged as um, as a casting destination with both fly and lure. Um, it, it has a, it did evolve over the over the subsequent say five years in, into a bit of a trolling destination um, due to the clientele. Uh, but we're going to take it where we, we are and we already have um, started switching back to a truly a mixed fishery, uh, uh, which can be catered to each group or each angler's preference of, of how they like to fish. Yeah, so I've got a picture of Glenn Macon here on the screen. He's going to be on my trip in a month and he's got a whopping bass with the boys on a giant <laughs> donger surface lure. I mean, yeah. I had a had a few chats to him uh, on Messenger, and he reckons he's dead keen to just throw surface lures. And I'm definitely going to spend at least a day or two doing the same. But you can see, like all the various pictures and the footage, there's just no shortage of snags and lily pads and these little grassy banks where uh, Glenn's recommended the surface lures. I mean, there's just got to be unlimited amount of country. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that picture there, it it it, it shows about how um, Glenn fishes, and it and it shows about um, the fishery as well. It's sort of two separate things, you know. Like um, Glenn, I've taken Glenn fishing a, a few times, and, and um, he he's always. I'm like, oh, let's throw fly around here, and he's like, nah, let's throw the best thing that's going to catch the best fish. Um, <laughs> So if he if he's thrown that lure there, that's the famous donga lure. It's two hundred and thirty mil long. It's about the size of a coke yeah. bottle. <laughs> um, if if he's thrown that, uh, that's the best lure to throw at the time, you know. And, and and you know, and you and you look at the. I mean, I've spoken to him about this fish a lot of times. It, there's so many creeks that flow into the lake. And and into the various rivers, um, which have got those beautiful grassy or reeded banks, that you can do a huge cast with a big service lure and just tick 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 slowly walk it up the bank and 
and just wait for that that bass there that'd be that's a high 80s bass maybe 90s i haven't actually got to be um, got a number high 30 of that. pounds isn't it <clears throat> yeah it's definitely that's 35 plus pounds fish and and, and that's the upper that's sort of the upper limit of of the fish of that you that you're looking to encounter and i mean fair income like the 50 centimeter ones pull your arms off but uh <laughs> There, there's been one fish over a meter caught in Lake Murray. Uh, it was 120 wow. centimeters caught by a Japanese guy um, up at a, oh, a spot yeah, which yeah. I know quite well. Uh, and we've got some more info on there. And if anyone wants to um, hit us up, I'll tell you a really cool story about that particular fish. Um, but 102 centimeters of black bass is pretty much like pulling in a, um, you know, a, a 200 series land cruiser with a teenager doing circle work in it. It, it, it is off its head. And, um, <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the, the bigger fish that we caught on our trip, they're like the 82, 85s. And you get them to the net and you're like, how the hell did you do that? Um, <laughs> so it, as far as fish fighting strength goes, it entirely without question, um, as far as size to pull ratio, but to get back to the, what we're talking about is the techniques is that um, it did evolve into a trolling destination uh, pre COVID. It's something that we um, have very easily um, pulled the trigger on and, and been able to switch back around because we sent some anchor chain kits over to New Guinea. Uh, they're there right now. Um, so instead of us, uh, you know, if we want to cast lures, like you'll see in the video, tied up to the edge of the bank and casting into snags and then trying to fish, uh, extract fish <laughs> from sort of further within the snag, we can now fish from the middle of the river, casting into snags and pull fish into, into water that perhaps has yeah, yeah. more of a chance of us getting them back in. <laughs> um, even though, you know, like... 90% of the fun of, of doing, of, of casting a, a weedless soft plastic into a snag for a black, for a 30 Ooh. pound black bass is, is getting your ass kicked. Uh, it, it, <laughs> it, it, it is or would be nice to land one every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's going to be awesome. So yeah, the guides know their stuff, obviously, like you can fish however you want. You can troll and drink, uh, drink New Guinea tins or you can cast your fly rod if you're <laughs> into that kind of thing or cast a deep snags to ask the boys and they'll they'll know the spots the best place to do it yeah for sure and and you know the 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 opportunity for i guess uh shallow water snag casting is it uh, grows by the day the more and more people that want to do it the more the guides are uh bringing these areas that they know because, you know, they, they were born on the river. They, they know where it all is. They, they bring it into the fold as far as incorporating it into a, a day of fishing goes. So, um, you know, those, those people that start um, requesting to go casting are, are probably going to get onto fresher fish um, in reality, even though they're probably going to be harder to actually put into a net um, <laughs> than... <laughs> than than if you were to go back to the regular horn. Although, I mean, like we say, 160,000 acres, five rivers flowing into it, you, you're never going to pressure the river to a point where um, you can say, oh, well, all the um, everyone the week before caught all the fish and we couldn't catch any because they all had hooks in them. It's just yeah. not a thing. It's not like, uh, it's not like going down shady to try and, catch your metery down there, you go out to Lake Murray, you're not going to see other blokes in boats with uh, the dubstep pounding through the stereo, taking all your good spots. Oh, um, I mean, it, it, since now that I'm involved in the business it, and, and my history, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to Shady Camp next week for a guided fishing trip myself. Um, half of Darwin's going to be there. There'll be 100 boats there every day. And my clients are going to have a great time at, at Shady Camp because the fishing is really great. But the fishing charter aspect of going to Lake Murray Lodge is cheaper than coming to fish with me here in Darwin for 
five days for Barra with half a Darwin. And you yeah. will be the only boats in <laughs> that entire system uh, fishing, um, sport fishing. You know, the locals are there trying to catch a feed. They do it with a hand line and a small gill net to catch a tilapia or a um, Saratoga. You got like the, the it's, uh, you cannot comprehend the, the value <laughs> the of ulti- the of ultimate fishery. fishery with no one around. I think you said to me, there's no one there. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. I think when you got back, I said, so go on, what's it like? And you said, once you fish it, you're never going to want to fish anywhere else. Mm. I shouldn't say that because I've, I've got to keep taking people fishing here in Darwin, which is also <laughs> great fishing. <laughs> but I mean, New Guinea, like I say, there's no roads that go there. The only way you can get to Lake Murray to fish as a recreational angler is through Lake Murray Lodge. And there's 12 trips a year. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, and every and fish for, is thrown back. <clears throat> and, and to, in, and to include international flight there's six flight currently uh, we budget for six flights to, from cairns cairns and cairns to lake murray and back is six flights plus five and a half days of fishing for less than eight and a half grand i mean you can't do a trip to darwin for that so no, no. It, it 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 baffles me uh, um, <laughs> why this lodge isn't booked out um but well, here we are <laughs> that's good it's good for us because we get to go fish it, but I don't think it's going to have many vacancies for long time here. All right, we'll keep this uh, uh, video going. Totally agree. Seems to be run off fishing all through the year here. Um, perhaps got a seven month season. I think it'd take a lifetime to explore the whole thing, but these guys, the local guys, they know it backwards and um, we couldn't ask for any better guides for sure. Predominantly we've been targeting the black bass, which is I guess the, the real iconic species for the area. Immediately when someone talks about black bass is that they are one of, if not the strongest fighting freshwater fish that you can come across. And this week has just proved that point to us. Uh, these fish are big, they're angry, they hit you with such force. Oh, how good is it? <laughs> Got, any, got anything to add there? Nicholas just uh, hyping it up. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's... The an- anticipation. It's, it's, I mean, I've been hearing about yeah. Black Bass my entire life. I better not yeah. get COVID I mean, we the saw day before it. I go or something. <laughs> you, you and I were probably sitting on the beanbag at home in Western Victoria watching um, when when um, Paul Worsling went there and, and when Rex went to Ben's back and, and now we've, we've got the ability to be there ourselves. And um, <laughs> it just, you know what? Um, it, it, it just continuously blows me away. One thing I will say is that if you look at that picture right there with that, um, that's a Dr. Evil, uh, classic Lewis Dr. Evil, and we uh, changed the hooks out to big singles. Um, those yeah, bass yeah. have a big jawbone. So um, those big, uh, that was a 7 Raptor, uh, BKK Raptor that we changed that um, hook to. And as soon as we did that, those they didn't get away. It pulls them up nice and clean through the jawbone. And, and of course, being a single and, and nicely tucked around the jawbone for a good release as well. So but we're re- really working towards... And, and striving for a really sustainable fishery uh, there as well as a, as, as a spectacular fishery as well, because, you know, the, the locals rely on it and, and, and everyone wants it to con- continue to be, uh, be essentially untouched um, for as long as it possibly can. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everybody benefits if the, the local guys are, are looking out for the bass. They know that the bass mean visitors. So you got to get them away, release them fresh. But uh, you reckon taking the taking the leap of faith into single hooks to keep you clear of the snags a bit and maybe a couple of less hookups that you'll probably never know about. But uh, once the yeah, hooks I get in their mouth. It, I, I, I dispute it, and I know you probably only said it because you think you should have said it. 
um, that you get less hook hookups with single hooks. Um, if you, <laughs> the, the savvy um, social media angler will have screenshotted this image and realized that the, the rear hook um, is attached so it points upwards. So it yeah. essentially when it's um, being dragged through a snag is, is entirely weedless. And, and, and so is the front treble. Uh, and sometimes that means you've got to put two split rings on, but if you can turn the, turn the hook point up so that it rides flush or up against the belly of the lure rather than yeah, pointing okay. downwards can uh, exponentially uh, increase your um, effective lure meters in a troll or a cast be simply because you're not getting hooked up um, compared to a treble, which even if you have them set up the right way where two might be running up the belly of the lure and one down is always going to hook that snag that your belly's dragging over. Even with a lure like a Dr. Evil, which is a heavy nose down lure, uh, anything that's pointing down does tend to get um, those uh, hookups from the snag. So I, 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 for all of my lures, um, for particularly chasing big bass, um, I'll be chucking some big singles on um, yeah, okay. one or two split rings for sure. Because honest, uh, I mean, another part of that's a whole, it's a whole different area um, of conversation, but a single hook has a much wider gape than a treble hook, right? I mean, we all look at a treble hook, a, a 2 o or something, which you, which you would put on a Dr. Evil to troll for a bass and you go, oh yeah, heaps of pointy stuff that'll hook them up. But if you if you take the equivalent weight um, and how a lure is going to respond to that hook and you can put a 7 o or 8 o single hook on it, you're at least doubling the amount of gape between the hook shank and the uh, and the point of the hook for the fish to actually get hooked, which, I mean, I think that's the goal. Am I right? Um, that compared to a stay treble hooked. hook, so <clears throat> to to get hooked and stay hooked, and, and I mean, you can you can take the barbs off those things if you want. It makes no difference. So all those all those big sport fishing hooks have micro barbs on them anyway because they see the value in actually penetrating the hook and getting a positive hookup um, compared to having a big fat point and a big barb that will not push through and then first jump or first turn rolls out. All the good hooks these days have micro barbs that and, and absolute slender um, needle points that push through, get into the barb, and then the barb is, is just there as a, as a backup to poor angling or... Or you know mishaps or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Falling, um, falling over in the boat. That it's sort a, of stuff. It, it, it's a backstop. Yeah, falling over in the boat. Mate. Um, that's it's definitely so you want to. So a, yeah, you want to quite comfortably be able to lose what a couple, three, three or four lures a day, just busting them off to snags or or losing them to fish, and probably a good idea to take a, a set of bogers or instead of unhooking your own fish maybe let the guides do it because if you get a big treble or a single through your hand you're in the middle of nowhere <laughs> yeah yeah i mean as far as lures goes and what you might lose in a day you're not going to lose too many lures uh the guides know exactly the depth of the of the water um and they know which lure should go where um they've got some good the the tackle backs that you slide down the, um, with the string and and jiggle them off if you if you do happen to get a, a truly a snag, um, so that I mean getting towed up by a fish is a different story. Uh, people are happy. I mean I'm happy to lose a lot to do doing that, um, and that might yeah two or three times a day, um, but yeah. with the right so setup it probably should happen. Don't... Don't be shy with uh, the amount of lures you take. Expect to lose a few. You don't want to be stressing that you're no. down to your last Doctor Evil. You want to just take some, don't some get backups it. so you can happily happily definitely, lose a few. Definitely don't get attached to your lures. Don't don't write <laughs> "I love you" on the side of your lure with a permanent texture because you 
you're probably never going to be able to realise that dream when the lure comes back. Um, <laughs> I was but, just and, uh, and, and, I was just packing my tackle box yesterday, and I put in a big ass B fifty two, and I was like. I caught a metery on that. No way am I taking that to PNG. <laughs> Put it yeah. back on the shelf. That's that's never going. When you tie, <laughs> when you tie it on in your guinea, um, give it a kiss and say goodbye. And, it, and if you get it back and it comes back to your box at the end of the trip, that's good. Otherwise, it's been taken by something that deserves it more than you. Um, <laughs> as far as bogus and all that sort of stuff goes, you you definitely need a a set of bogus per per boat. Um, you, you need to bring all your own tackle for both Ben's back and Lake Murray trips. So, um, bow grips or some some form of lip grip definitely is, is a must. There, there's landing nets there, um, but everything else after that is is up to you. Um, so, uh, lip grips and and some good solid long nose pliers, so you don't get yep. your little um, fingies in in amongst a forty pounder's mouth, which will put a hole straight through you. Without any <laughs> you don't want to treble hook in your knuckle out there. <clears throat> Alrighty, let's keep it cranking. Yep. <laughs> yep. Come on, fish. <laughs> <laughs> so just a note, you see like you just getting absolutely smoked. Um trolling along there. The guides use the old uh, barramundi <laughs> trick of once you hook up when you're trolling, looks like they're flooring it away to the centre of the river to try and drag the fish out. Yeah, um, with bass, you definitely need to do that. I mean, on, on a lot of the troll runs, they're not on real... Oh, actually, it, it's not true. Some of them are heavy timber. Some of them are old stumps. Um, but to get... Um, uh, to get an, any sort of advantage over the fish, to be able to blast out and drag them to the middle is is pretty pretty important. Um, you see there, uh, me get my ass kicked a couple of times, and um, and look, that's the story of bass fishing, and and it, and it's in uh, and there's one hundred percent the reason why I'm going back um, is because I got my ass kicked, and that's that's fishing a um, that's fishing Nabu Garcia Revo Beast, which comes straight out of the box with 14 kilos of drag. I had that thing done up as tight as I could pull it out, um, perhaps tighter, um, with 80 pound braid and 80 pound leader. And, um, you know, off my feet when I was getting a hit from casting a lure, either that or, you know, having a flat rod and smoking a thumb. Um, when you get when you get one on the trail, so yeah, you just think of how can I get bigger and heavier, but there's really no way. Uh, <laughs> so you've just got to hope for a bit of luck. Yeah, well, if you if you can't crank your drag up so much that you're going to snap eighty pound line, I mean, there's no reason to go any higher. There's no reason to run a hundred and twenty pound line if you're not even snapping eighty just with the drag, yeah. No, that's right. Yeah, your whole system re revolves around the reel that you've got, and and, and then to a, a slightly lesser extent the rod that you're swinging it off. So, um, you know, your your regular barrow reels are going to be four six kilos of drag. Your Corrados, your Calais, um, your Tatulas, or your uh, even your nice high end Diver stuff. Um, not pushing much over eight kilos. Um, there's a few reels around there, which, which um, you know, if you join the mailing list and, and um, if you ask us, um, we can give you links to where to buy them. But the Abu, the Abu Revo Beast is one that you, you can buy in any tackle shop, um, 14 kilos straight out of the bag, as far as I know, 14, I think, uh, which is, ex which is a, a serious amount of drag and, and, and if you did that up to its capacity, then that's great. But then the next thing that's going to break is your rod. So then, then you need a really good rod to do it. And, and, uh, and that's when we get into the rods talk, which is a huge one. But, but in general, um, forget about the eight foot or nine foot rod tubes. I mean, I build a lot of rods for guys to go to New Guinea 
a fair few years ago now um, that were uh, eight foot long, super heavy things and they had to cart a rod tube and it's a complete nightmare. There is so many good brands of, um, of, he- of really high quality travel rods, four and five piece that you can chuck in your check-in luggage um, that you just don't need to worry about a one piece rod anymore. We, we use and really highly recommend the Jabbers range, um, both for New Guinea and for the stuff in here in the territory. I mean, I've, I've got a few rods floating around a couple of guides and wreck fishers here in, in Darwin. Um, the, the beast logger and the rage receiver that, that they just cannot speak more highly of, um, yeah, as, as a rod in itself. And then, and then the ability to be able to pack it down, um, you know, for a seven foot rod into something you can chuck in a backpack um, and go and catch a 40 pound bass. Uh, second to I mean, so, It's so good just being able to have a suitcase with nothing else and just lay your rods out nicely on the bottom, sandwich them in between a few clothes or whatever, and you don't have to worry about it. I mean, I used to carry a seven and a half foot bit of 100 mil plumber's pipe you know from the uk back to australia for christmas time and then forget that i chopped it in half because i've got uh two piece rods now <laughs> and now i'll be able to cut it in you know cut another quarter off it so it's getting smaller and smaller all the time as we go so now i'll be able to just put travel rods in it because they're just so good i've got travel rods for everything oh. and they, they never leave my car anymore yeah absolutely that i mean that is particularly if you're i mean um people that are interested we can um, send them some links to japanese tackle stores and all sorts of things but um we 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 love the jabbers rods and, um but there there is others if you're interested in others um the the fact of only having one check-in piece of luggage which you can chuck an air tag in and then know where it is because i can tell you now if you're if you're going to have trouble with your baggage it's going to be within Australia from Melbourne or Adelaide or Sydney to Cairns, um, not from not within New Guinea because everything seems to happen sweet and as per clockwork there with luggage. Um, but but if you've got an, if, if you've got everything in one bag, all your clothes and your rods and your tackle, and you fly from Melbourne with an air tag in your bag, and it gets sent to Sydney instead of Cairns. You can tell where it is. It's one piece. They they catch up with you. You're there the day before. You fly it out anyway, and then you're caught and gone, and off you go. You don't have to worry about oversized rod tubes and weight net baggage and all this extra shit. Uh, you'd be silly to take a full one piece rod traveling, yeah, fishing, yeah, um, yeah, adventure fishing these days. So we're rattling off a fair bit about tackle, but um, once you sign up to take your trip to Lake Murray, you get a big info pack with all this sort of stuff about all the info about hook sizes and what lures you should be taking and how many, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's no need yeah. to write down everything out of this <clears throat> out of this video and and try and get on Mo Tackle at the same time. So once you once you're all uh, booked in, you get all the secrets. <laughs> yeah, and, and of course to, it does seem pretty I, overwhelming um, and pretty scary because all people say is how crazy and uh, hard these bass fight. I just thought I'd put up a picture here of, of Margie who went about four years ago or something with her late husband, Robert, and he's written us a testimonial. She was just could not believe the fish they were catching over there. And like she said herself, she's a slightly, slightly built woman and she's just rebooked. She's going back this year, I think mid this year, uh, with her son. Yeah. And she just cannot wait to get stuck into them again. So while we do talk about upgrading hooks and snapping rods and stuff with the uh, the guides looking after you, Margie says, yeah, absolutely no worries. Yeah, absolutely. And, and a big part I know from uh, Margie's last trip and what she's keen to get involved with again on this trip is is just um learning more about the local culture and stuff of the people um that that create um these trips and and that live in the surrounding villages and stuff so yeah i mean um she's embraced the whole spectrum of what it's all about and 
that's what we hope everyone does and, and gets a gets a taste over the next few years because like Murray, I mean the the reality of all, all of the, the trips that we offer through angling adventures, but particularly these trips in Papua New Guinea is that there is a limited season with limited spaces. So there'll, there'll come a time, it'll probably be 2024 when um, the, the trips are maxed out. And if you want to get in, uh, you're going to have to book at least 12, maybe two, 24 months in advance uh, because we want to keep the fishery as pristine as it can be and the experience as, as wholesome and as true as it can be to the local experience. Absolutely. That's more than just a fishing trip. All right, we'll keep this video going. <laughs> oh, fuck. This is a very, very big angry black bass. The bass beer. Oh! It's hard to describe a black bass. Um, Just uh, raise your hand if you want if you want to cut in with anything there, Glenn. But look like you guys were <laughs> um, casting at uh, what sunk a timber there. Your nick off the front of the boat. Yeah, those um those shots. I mean, you can tell when we're casting, when we're trolling. Um, the when we're casting is uh, you can you can see the trees there. It's actually a tree that we get here in um, in Darwin as well, particularly down the Daly River. Um, we call it a Leichhardt tree here in in the territory, and um, it'll it'll fall over and create awesome lay down snags and and some nice upright um, timber snags as well on the edge to cast at and. Um, yeah, we just tied up to the bank there, and uh, you see me um, falling over on one of those casts. That was uh, that. I, I honestly, I it's really hard for me to convey the feeling of that um, particular experience because Kane was um, videoing the boy, the guides talking shit about something, and and I was casting a seven-inch gulp uh, jerk shad. Um, rigged up on an 8 worm hook upside down with a um, number four, I think, ball sinker and a loop knot, which I can more than happy to talk about. Uh, lifting and dropping it through the snags um, in an area that uh, we s suspected that the fish had gone a bit quiet on because we we trolled over it a few times and hadn't had um, any any reaction for a little while. And uh, And uh, standing on the front of the tinny seat on the is a there a four point eight meter. It's actually boat built in Brisbane. It's a motor, and um, and got pulled clean off my feet uh, on the strike. Uh, <laughs> never forget it. And I uh, um, entirely got my ass kicked and and got up and just went holy. Uh, it, it was like you um, being my bigger little brother went came up straight behind me and pushed me as hard as you could off the back off the tinny seat and um no Deb didn't even get hooked up uh <laughs> just yeah and, and was left shaking and sweating and i mean sweating more than i already was and um just was like holy shit let's do that again um <laughs> the, the benefit of, 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 of you going back there, I, I miss out on this next trip because I'll actually be fishing here in the territory, but um, is that we'll have some good anchors um, in the boats and, and you'll be able to anchor off that particular snag, um, the nutcracker, and <laughs> um, and cast cast into it and then on drag fish out into deeper water, whereas when we were there, we were tying up to the bank and, and um, yeah. trying to pull fish essentially heavier, deeper into the snags. So um, yeah. odds were against us, but bloody hell, uh, I'm so glad they were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, heaps of fun. I mean, it's got to be said, you never see people using them, but those gulp lures are magical, especially for Barra. That is some sort of voodoo stuff, that. 
Yeah, there's a lot of science behind gold, but if people are interested, they can contact me and I've got a heap of links about um, scent and how it affects um, recreational fishing results. Um, but definitely um, the legionid fish, uh, burnt um, black bass, our golden snapper here in, in the Northern Territory, mangrove jacks and, and stripies that we find out on the reef, they really respond well to scent. And, um, and in an enclosed system like Lake Murray, uh, if you're trying to get down deep in amongst the snags and get a reaction out of something, you can't always get a vibration or a sparkle or a whatever happened. So if you can get some scent happening uh, and, and draw that fish from a metre or two away, um, that can be the difference between you getting your ass kicked and, and you not getting a bite. So, <laughs> I'm down right. with that. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep it going. You will have to uh, put your hand up if you if you want me to stop it because I, I can't hear you once she's playing. This is a very, very big, angry black bass. The bass beer. Oh! It's hard to describe a black bass. Um, the strongest fish I've ever had to fight, for sure. Particularly the first hit. That's a big fish. Up him. Oh, fuck. Up him. We're in trouble here, boys. <laughs> <laughs> Can just see you trying to hang on while the boys are powering out into the middle of the river with the drag just like you know when the when your line's peeling off your bait caster from each side of the spool <laughs> and you've got no hope yeah <laughs> you, I just, mean, you just know you're in trouble that that i i can take you there right now like that that's at um, a fish at a spot they call eye fish. Um, anyone who's seen <laughs> the the older videos of Lake Murray, um, Paul Worsling catches a couple of nice bass um, at that particular spot when the river was much much lower. Mm -hmm. um, but there's some there's some little individual stumps there, and, and there's not a heap of feature, but it just holds fish. And uh, yeah, I mean you that's something you, you come to get used to when you go bass fishing at Lake Murray is getting your ass kicked. <laughs> so um, that's on a, um, that particular one, I, I, I think is that's a, um, just give me a look at the reel. Yeah. That's the, um, that rod is the, uh, that's the that's bone, bone yeah. voyage. Yeah. That's the bone voyage, Papa and bass big bait, which is the, which is the biggest, Oh, the heaviest rod that um, Bone does, uh, and that's um, that's with that Revo beast on it as well. Again, yeah, with fourteen kilos, I've probably got that drag at that time set at about ten kilos. So that's where we get a bucket with ten liters of water in it, and we just gently lift it up off the surface, off the floor, and and just make sure that drag set. And then, and then ideally the the go is to back the drag off from there as you get a fish closer to the boat. Um, but, you know, with black bass fishing, you often have to do the drag, which is <laughs> not ideal so, during the fish fight because you, you start pulling against every, every other link in the chain. But, um, yeah. You can see um, in all this footage when the bass gets close to the net, I mean, it's, it's a pretty silly comparison, but just like people from Victoria will know that the, one of the worst fish I think to net is a trout. They just flap, 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 flap all the way in. And, but when you've got a bass that's 35 pounds plus, like it looks like every one of them is just twisting and flailing and flapping like all the way to the net every time. Like there's no clean net shots in this whole video. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, in... Uh, they are compared um, to a mangrove jack in other conversations, and and that's about where where the similarity ends is is at the net shot is that um, you know they they sort of get half beaten and they, and then they start slashing their heads around at the end and um, I mean that's why we use big nets and and um, experienced guides so that we can get the fish to the net. But the bass, uh, um, as far as their fight goes, the they really do 
fight like a mangrove jack or a peacock bass in that they'll come out and take a lure sort of on the way back in um, to a snag. Uh, and then the power of their lunges is sort of unexpected throughout a fight. And, and compared to, a, I mean, a mangrove jack is, it, is an amazing sport fish, um, but they do run out of steam particularly once you crank a drag on them, but um, bass just don't. And you'll get a bass to the net and you can see, I think there's a scene up a bit further where I'm holding a bass and you can hear him just like chomping on the bogey grips <laughs> and looking at Kane like as though, if you let me go, I will eat you. And, and <laughs> like, just because you've got him in the net doesn't mean they're done type thing. Um so yeah, uh, utmost respect to the fish. Yeah, I'll have to um, I'll have to edit that in. But yeah, you're holding the fish with the bogers, and just like occasionally a barrow when you've got a boger on him, you buff his mouth. You can hear the bass snap his mouth <laughs> like a little mango jack oh, snapping yeah. a popper off the surface. But he's chomping on <laughs> huge boger grips. And just goes. <laughs> yeah, he's chomping on sixty pound boger grips up, and his head pulled off. Um, by 10 kilos of drag and dragged into a boat and he still wants to fight. <laughs> this, this is the Mike Tyson of, uh, of, of fishing. <laughs> what has got railroaded? Mangrove jack on steroids doesn't, doesn't do them justice. They're stronger. Oh, there's absolutely no question. <laughs> I mean, it's a big fish. I don't think we got any still photos of this one, but look at that thing. I mean, like the color on that is crazy. You can see the photos of the, the smaller ones. They've got like a lot more stripey, aren't they? There's a couple of real pale yeah. ones you guys caught and then this real copper sort of one. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. I mean, it, it, and it, it goes, it's entirely along with the whole theme of, of Lake Murray Lodge and, and um, Papua and Black Bass as a, as a sport fishing sp target species is that no one knows anything about their colours. Uh, you know, Rod Harrison and, and Dean Butler were there in the 80s um, and and they caught smaller fish, um, like one of the ones you see in, in one of the um, B-rolls in the film, which have got the, the stripes down them. Yeah, and they called it for a um, like a juvenile fish or whatever. Um, but you you can see that those markings happen in in fish over eighty centimeters, and, and at the same time you can get yeah, a really a, a, a small one with um, when I say small fifty centimeters that's proper dark and red. Yeah, that one there. I mean. To me, that's characteristic. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a juvenile bass. But you can get them 80 centimetres of that colour or you can get them that are that size and they're dark red or dark black. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, the reality is that, that really nothing is known about these fish. Uh, there's never been a tagging program done on them. Um, there's never been any significant scientific studies done on them. Uh, and it's something that, you know, uh, we we would love to be part of going forward, um, as long as we do it in the right ways. Um, because the, I mean, the species has a huge value to, yeah. to New Guinea. Uh, in in that, it, it's enough, and it's a whole other conversation. Is that it's not very far from Cape York or from Darwin to New Guinea, but we don't have bass here. And I, <laughs> almost every day I think, oh, Jesus, it'd be awesome to put a bass in Mountain Dam or Darwin Harbour. Um, <laughs> or Corroboree. <laughs> or Corroboree Billabong. And I'm sure they'll do so well. But there is a reason over 50 million years that they're not here. So um, I guess we'll just leave it at that at the moment. But... Yeah, I mean, we don't know. We don't know the different colours, whether, you know, we took um, same thing in billfish, you know, they come up lit up and then they darken up. Same thing in blue bone, they darken up, snapper darken up, barra darken up. 
Um, is it a feeding thing? Is it excitement? Is it age? Is it whatever? We don't, no one knows. Um, and anyone can say whatever they want, um, but no one actually knows because no studies have been, have been done. But look at either way, uh, they look bloody cool and, um, <laughs> and I'm keen to learn more. I like these. Um, some of them have got this war paint sort of stripe coming back from their eyeball. That's pretty cool. Oh, spectacular fish. Yeah, that, that yeah. bigger and one's that, got oh, it too. A little stripe there back they, from the oh, eye. Yeah, back from the eye, back to back to the sort of what would be the ear. And and they always are looking at you like I will chew <laughs> you up. Always. <laughs> why these things would tear you up into any snag that the fight of that fish was extraordinary <laughs> and look at the shoulders on that thing it looks like it's about to burst out of its skin and the thickness <laughs> of the tail wrist like just an absolute chunk eh? yeah that's a, a scary fish no matter which way you look at it the fight of that fish was extraordinary <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing to me, brother? Here we go. <laughs> Second troll run. Pull on him. My shoulders are sore from pulling that in. That was unreal. That black bass has just straightened that hook. There's Nick with his spray jacket on after copping a bit of rain for the day. You're saying what rains every day, so just get ready for it. Yeah, yeah, it does. It pretty well, even through the through the middle of the year, you you're gonna to expect to get wet. So you you really want to take a um take a spray jacket if you if you care about getting wet. Um for me I I don't bother because it's it's a nice refreshing shower. Um we get talking about those hooks, yeah, that's a the the one on his little finger owner ST sixty six that's the standard scorpion hook, um, and then the uh, BKK Raptor at the front, sort of um, change them out as they got bent <laughs> was was the plan <laughs> on that lure, but perhaps not the best plan. I no. I'd recommend changing them all out before you tie the lure on. So a lot of the spots you were trolling, you're talking like 20 foot plus, five meter plus divers. Yeah, the trolling spots, uh, it depends on the time of year, early in the year, deeper, middle of the year, not so deep. And, and then of course, um, once it starts raining, the build up a little bit deeper again, but uh, you can, yeah, the those 125 mil scorpions, that they, they're a five and an eight meter, so it's good to have a couple of them. Um, they definitely don't go that deep, regardless. Uh, well, maybe they do in testing, but not when you're dragging them on 80 pound leader and 80 pound braid. <laughs> the the, um, the force of the line just won't let them go that deep. So they might go about six meters at that time, and uh, and that's pretty much the the sweet spot for some of those deeper trolling spots. Um, but the yeah, I mean the the casting areas are they range between one and four meters. Um, yeah, so you well, want a, you so. want a good range. <clears throat> you need a good range, and and we've got a quite a comprehensive tackle sheet there. And and, a, and of course, if you really want to um, nut nut out some fine details, just give me a ring. Yeah, so obviously with it raining every day, when you jump on the boat in the morning, you just want what, a couple of tackle trays and then some sort of waterproof bag to keep maybe your phone or your camera in and then maybe a dry, small dry towel or something to, you know, wipe your sunnies or something along those lines. Yeah. You wouldn't need too much. The boys have got all your lunch and everything packed and your beer cold. Yeah, absolutely. All your lunch and um, drinks and everything is packed and stuff, but, um, as far as tackle goes, it's actually a good conversation because uh, you, you'll find um, tackle trays, uh, as we have in our boats um, with our journey, <clears throat> just take up way too much room um, and don't store enough stuff. So um, as a travelling angler now, um, going to Lake Murray, what you want to do is get yourself some either soft bags you can get on um on eBay or wherever and get some um, brand name ones, Mega Bass do a really good one. Uh, Berkeley do a couple of um, soft clear bags um, mm. or it, 
if, if you're like me, um, jump on Ali, Alibaba and grab some uh, makeup bags for two bucks and just get some little rubber bands and just run them around your treble hooks and bang them in your um, in a clear, soft, packable bag. Yeah, and you yeah, can I gotcha. s- smush a heap more stuff into the same area. Your weight's going to be, well, it's going to be less because you're not having a plastic trackle tray, tackle tray. Um, but then you you definitely want to keep or want to have all your stuff in a waterproof bag. A roll top bag is good because they tend to be quite big and, um, you know, like a sack and you can just shove stuff in them and roll them and when there's a shower. Um, I've got both. I've got the roll top and, and then I've got like the Ziploc type um, pull tag ones. Um, as far as tackle goes, I like to have the, the roll top with all my soft bags um, with everything I don't want to get wet, hooks, trebles, um, camera gear, whatever it might be, phones, and just shove it in and just roll, 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 clip, and, and then it's done. Because you, you almost, you're, you're definitely guaranteed to get wet at least once a trip almost every day yeah. um, throughout the year. So just be prepared. You don't want to be scrounging uh, garbage bags. Yeah, you're going to get the, out, of the, uh, get out of the lodge. You want to have yeah. a nice uh, watertight bag while you're on the boat. Hot tip. And they don't have to be expensive either. You can get them at BCF no. and um, Anaconda for 30 or 40 bucks to, to hold all your lure and your phone and everything too. So... Um, it, it's just something to keep in mind. Okay. No problem at all. Six or eight kilos of drag on that, reckon I. 80 pound braid and 80 pound leader. <laughs> There's no messing around in your guinea. There's a real um, real black grand slam of Lake Murray if you want to try them all, but we're catching a lot of barramundi as well. And I think it's been the general consensus with our group. We all uh, couldn't believe how strong they fight. I guess they're hanging out with the black bass a lot. <sighs> this is the biggest barrier I've caught in. I was just going to comment on how clean all the barra. I mean, it's pretty awesome going to another country and tracking down fish to catch, but then seeing your old mate barra over there at the same time, that's pretty sweet. You might even feel a yeah. warm, fuzzy feeling when you catch a caddy. <laughs> well, yeah, actually, we did. I don't think we caught any caddies on both of my trips, but they're definitely there um, because local boys eat them. Uh, they catch them on bait. They use dead bait for them. But, yeah, I mean, the barra, um, and it, go, it goes to show, it proves the whole concept of um, uh, of the water quality that barra in um, is – is what dictates their colour. Um, you know, these fish, that fish there that you can see, has, has, I could almost guarantee has never seen salty water because he's 150 kilometres upstream of, of the mouth of the river in a, in a 160,000 acre lake. So, um, but... <laughs> well, it, if he's, but he's, if he's in Lake Murray, <laughs> if he's in Lake Murray, he's probably over a thousand k's from the sea. Yeah. Exactly. So, a, a, so swamp donkey, a swamp donkey his entire life, and he doesn't look like a, a golden corroboree billabong barrow, does he? <laughs> no, that's right. And, and it, it's it's got nothing to do with the oh, oh well, I should the the colour of the fish has got nothing to do with the eating quality of the fish. Not that that's an issue at Lake Murray, because if you want to eat a fish, which you certainly can, uh, you're going to do it with a bass because the the black bass is like the red it's like the red fin of the um of, <laughs> of uh, um it's so good to eat uh, and you know over a fire or um you know wrapped up in some banana leaves with a bit of salt on it just tastes yeah. just like red fin or flathead like everyone's familiar with so good um <laughs> but the barra the the barra is 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 um part of the staple diet of the local guys. And, uh, you know, a fish like that may be a bit too big, but, um, you know, 60, 70 centimetre fish, um, you know, if there's a local, um, it's an interesting thing uh, because in Papua New Guinea, fishing is um, is women's work. So it's always the ladies that are out in the canoes doing the fishing. The men are off hunting. <laughs> and, 
And um, so if there's any of the lady, local ladies um, out fishing nearby and we catch a barra that's a good eating size, um, you know, take always offer it to them. And so we um, should they, uh, we should get some ladies on the boat guiding them, ask them where the spots are. Well, absolutely. I, I mean, it's always a, a bit of a joke within the guides. They're like, why do why do we only get um, blokes come over here fishing because fishing's women's work? <laughs> um, I mean, we've got we've got Marg and we've got a few other um, lady anglers coming from Australia for this season. But yeah, it's interesting how the different cultures see see different yeah, roles. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All righty, we'll keep it going. Up in New Guinea. And had fought like a well over a metre fish from Australia. It's a big part of the trip, I think, is to is to catch some fish they're a bit familiar with as well. Barra Mundi fishing's been great. Barra and bass in the boat, so the bar's open. Oh, we're really excited to bring <coughs> bring more and more people over here to experience the environment, uh, the culture, meet these guys, and the fishing is just a huge bonus on top of that adventure that you're doing. So. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the gut on that thing. I mean, they're always coming into the net and just twisting and writhing all the way in. Like, <laughs> I think the guys have got new nets this year, don't they? But uh, still, they look like a hand. They do. They've got, yeah, they've got all new nets. That's one of the old spring nets there, um, which are great for moving around in the water and chasing fish, but perhaps not so good for uh, fish handling. But um, <clears throat> yeah, we've kitted all the boats out with. Um, that same big wide mouth uh, with net with the silicon silicon nets oh, um, cool, yeah. for all the guide boats for this year. Yeah, um, both at Lake Murray and Ben's back. Just look at that gut on that thing. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a that's an eighty plus centimeter bass. That one and um, yeah, that's, flopping in uh, sideways. Just, yeah, flopping in sideways. Great, great net shot and a little bit of luck involved there. <laughs> Who who landed that one? Who caught that one? Uh, that'd be Dennis landing that um who hooked that it? fish and and Kane, the cameraman caught that. Oh that's Kane's fish. Big, yeah, big fish. Yeah, yeah, Kane caught that one. The it's way I see it, if you, you can come yeah. here and you can experience all that and you catch a few fish, then you know you've had a good trip. This is why you make the effort to come and travel to these remote places. <laughs> A beautiful fish, probably the hardest biting freshwater fish in the world. And to be able to do it with some really legendary guides that know the spots and can tell you all about the local culture and the way they live as well. It's a really special trip that we'll never forget and we'll be back again next year and I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful, what a way to wrap it up. You can just tell when you're talking about the prospect of going back and seeing the guides and. Catching the fish again, unreal. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, I mean, I, I mean, I think about that right now. Like, and as we're doing this recording, one of the guides from Bensbacks um, calling me on WhatsApp, and and the the connection that we have with these guys, and um, and the locations, and the value it that has in in the landscape shouldn't be understated um, from a recreational fishing point of view, but but also from political and just being good people point of view. Um, they're, they're amazing people. They want to share their, um, their land and their culture with all of us. And um, to be given the opportunity to go in there as the, as the only operators that that can uh, do recreational fishing charters out of Lake Murray is a real privilege for uh, for us as angling adventures and and we don't take that lightly and um, and the the dozen or so trips that we do a year will re will absolutely reflect uh, the value that we place on on, mm -hmm. on that. Brilliant. Can't wait to go and get a piece of it. I've just got Kane's uh, fish up on screen here. That this was the one that was just landed with the big fat guts. I've got um, I've got the little video of Kane actually fighting that fish here. <coughs> I'll just get up. 
is it? It's pretty funny. This is a fella that um, he's travelled all around the world, caught all the biggest fish. And, um, yeah, I mean, he's not the biggest man in the world, but <laughs> it, it, throws a pers- it throws a perspective on it that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. he's he's uh he's put down the video camera from filming the uh filming the promo for us and what you're trolling down the river and give us a give us a commentary on this. Yeah, all we're doing we yeah, I mean he said to us, Oh yeah, we've got enough uh, for what we want for the promo, so um I'm knocking off and having a beer, give us a rod. <laughs> and I'll say, Oh well, no worries, because I'm keen for a beer and I'll take a video if anyone gets one. And we're trolling over the nutcracker. And <laughs> um, and here he goes with the Dr. Evil. He's held the rod for five minutes and he's caught two bass. One of them's an 85. So, <laughs> yeah, there you, you can go. just see, <clears throat> see hook up, floor the boat out to the middle of the river. <laughs> Everyone's shouting and yelling at him to get into it. He's standing on the gunnel. <laughs> And the guide's telling him, get in the boat, get in the boat. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the guides are, are used to the the plus 60s um, running around the boat, so they're not as, as not as agile as the old Chen, but um, he's, a, he's a handy fish, eh? even though he's a, got a little linguine. He managed to wrangle him into the boat. But, um, you know, yeah, same spot as, the, um, as that one metre and two centimetre bass was caught. Um, pre-COVID 2019 so um, plenty of big ones in that area for sure and what's that area called the nutcracker I'll put that on the yeah it's called that it's called the nutcracker there's a bit of a story to that which will hopefully be released pretty soon but um, it's actually up the Kyme River which is um, one of the local black bonnie it's one it's his country Um, so the the name that we put in the book when we catch a fish um, is Bonnie Spot um, because something that is also um, worth people knowing is that um, the, the five villages that um, that inhabit uh, Lake Murray uh, all welcome the um, sport fishing uh, tours that Angling Adventures and Trans New Guinea tours provides there through Lake Murray Lodge and there's an agreement with each of the villages um, for uh, access to their particular waters so um, this particular spot here is is owned by uh, a fellow named Bonnie and he's he's got four four brothers and they're the they're the primary landowners in that in that particular area and every time we go in there they get they get paid an access fee so um, which they which they're really happy with, and and, and we're really happy oh, to um, to give to them because they're great people, and, and one, we man. call in and say good day to them, and, and they welcome us in and um, and share their culture with us as well while we're on the trips. So um, it's a it's a ongoing um, uh, relationship that that um, should get better and better as the as the years go on uh, for for access and um, and benefits to the local people. Yeah, very good. I mean, compare that to say going fishing in Port Phillip Bay and you're fighting other boats off, and then <laughs> this granddad who's been fishing the same jetty for the last fifty years doesn't want you fishing in his spot, but these guys get rewarded when you go to visit their land. They look after the fish for you. They want you to catch lots of big fish, so you keep coming back to their little section of, of paradise, and all they want you to do is to hook up. Yeah, for sure, and 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 they love meeting, um, they love meeting the the travelling anglers and and hearing about um, what they do and and um, and and showing their way of life to to us when we come and visit and um, uh, that uh, that relationship is invaluable uh, going forward. So we 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 really cherish it and and we and we thank them for for allowing us to access them. What you know, if we weren't there, that's that's theirs on their own forever and ever. Um, and what a what an awesome place! But we're lucky enough that they share it with us, so we're very grateful for that. All right, we'll just uh, finish off with the <clears throat> the rest of Kane getting a severe flogging, and uh, you can give us your closing <laughs> statements. But 
I think I've just about got everything I need from my trip out of you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, I'm not going on the next on the next trip because I'm busy fishing here with half of Darwin on fishing charters at Shady Camp. But I will be joining you on the second half of the leg at Ben's back. But Lake Murray is, has become a place that uh, that I really have a, I've found a real connection with and. And I can see myself being there. I mean, if it was, we could get a direct flight from Darwin, I'd be there once a month. But I'll be there three or four times a year, and um, and and working with the guides to uh, to get there to to, to help facilitate them, provide um, clients with the best experience they can, and um, and also just to um, to geek out on uh, on being a um, adventure fisherman myself and. Learn about dugout canoes and catching ca- cassowaries and um, <laughs> spearfishing tilapia and and uh, all that sort of st- awesome stuff that those guys still do that you know we here don't don't do because you know we're too worried about the aircon settings or if the bed's made or not. <laughs> it's, it's a whole different world, and I can't wait to get back there. All righty, mate. We'll finish it up there. And uh, if anyone's got any questions, just hit us up on the website or the Facebook Messenger or any of those things. But uh, I think that'll answer quite a few of the silly questions that I had and hopefully get people up to speed with what they can expect and what they can look forward to when they head to Lake Murray. <laughs> Thanks very <laughs> yeah, much, Point. Right. Th- thank you, Brother D-Man. And... Um... Yeah, I mean, just just to touch on that, like uh, we talk about silly questions because uh, you and I have both been in fishing, uh, rec fishing guided industry for a long time and we sort of answer the same questions all the time. But um, don't be shy to, you know, reach out um, via email, text message or give me a call. Um, You know, my number's everywhere. and I'm keen to talk about fishing with anyone who wants to do it, um, particularly when it relates to Papua New Guinea and Lake Murray, um, because it's something that I'm going to spend a lot more time on over the next 30 years. What am I, 40 <laughs> now? 30, 40 years. Yeah, so it's going to be good, and we're going to get it really cranking. We're going to learn all about the fish. We're going to protect the fish. We're going to protect the culture, and, and we're going to enhance everyone's lifestyle and, and experiences there as well so yeah well done it's a great idea what you've done here pulling the video, uh, the little promo video apart and i hope everyone got something out of it yeah hopefully we'll be able to do one uh once me dad and al get back from ben's back hopefully we get lots of footage there and then uh, we can do something similar to answer any questions about ben's back so yeah we'll keep it that's going. Right. yeah yeah good and stuff um, all right have a good night We'll catch you next time. Good on you, mate. Thank you.